Time now for Morning Rounds with CBS News Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. John LaPook and CBS News contributor Dr. Holly Phillips. First up, important news for people at high risk for skin cancer, the most common form of cancer in this country. John? Anthony, non-melanoma cancers are found in more than 2 million Americans each year. Research finds a simple over-the-counter vitamin may lower the recurrence rate. Let me tilt your head up there. After multiple bouts of skin cancer, 48-year-old Eric Breslow knows he has to be vigilant for the rest of his life. We, we do body checks about four times a year just to be proactive to make sure that um, nothing gets out of hand. Breslow's skin cancers were basal and squamous cell, not melanoma. UV rays from the sun can damage the DNA of skin cells, prevent healing, and can lead to cancer. In a recent Facebook post to raise awareness of the dangers of tanning, 27-year-old Tawny Willoughby shows her facial scars after having been treated for the same kind of skin cancers as Breslow had. A new Australian study followed 386 patients with at least two previous bouts of non-melanoma skin cancer. One group was given a type of vitamin B3 called nicotinamide for one year, the other a placebo. The group taking the vitamin had a 23% reduction in skin cancer recurrence. Dr. Jessica Krant is Breslow's dermatologist. I'm very excited about this study, but it looks like patients who have a history of many skin cancers will be able to take a regular vitamin from the drugstore and reduce their risk of getting future skin cancers. What good is it if it's not totally preventing the lesions? There are patients who have multiple skin cancers a year. Some even have up to 100 skin cancers a year. For those patients to reduce by 25 percent the number of lesions they are having surgery for or having other treatments for is very significant. Those numbers are just stunning, John. And how could this change the strategy of protecting people from the sun? Well, remember, this is early research. It needs to be replicated. It's for people who have had at least two previous skin cancers. And of course, everybody wants to say, oh, you just take a pill. I don't have to worry about anything. And I really want to emphasize to everybody, this is not going to replace protecting yourself with protective clothing, wearing sunscreen, and making sure that you don't get a sunburn. A new report crunches the numbers on the staggering cost of prescription drugs. It finds more than half a million Americans needed more than $50,000 worth of medication last year. That is a jump of 63% from 2013. And the number with $100,000 drug bills nearly tripled. Those are huge numbers also. Yeah, I did a double take when I first saw those <laughs> numbers. You know, it turns out that most people who are taking these drugs, the highest drug spending is for the baby boomer population. 60% of the people whose drug costs are $100,000 thousand dollars or more a year are taking 10 or more drugs from wow. four or more providers. Mm -hmm. you know, these are really shocking numbers and the trend is going to continue to go up. The population is expected to continue to age for the next two decades. John, what drugs are accounting for most of this cost? Well, there are three categories. One are drugs to cure now. Hepatitis C it used to be a chronic disease. People took meds for the rest of their life and it's a big ticket item, but the drug companies are saying, well, look, you just you get cured and then that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, then there are the cancer drugs. Now, this is really interesting. A lot of them are you know, over $100,000 a year. Some of them are. And then the final category are compounding pharmacies. Now, I should say at the beginning, these definitely serve a role to make specific medicines that can't just be done normally mm -hmm. by a pharmacist. But there has been some abuse. And Jim Axelrod and Emily Rand did an incredible series last week that uh, found that the military was being billed up to $15,000 a month for these creams for veterans to relieve their chronic pain and it was of dubious value. So I think there's definitely room for ab abuse there and there's room for improvement. We've all been in that position though where you get a prescription back, you're shocked by the bill, but you feel like you have no choice. Is there is there something you could be doing that's proactive? Sure, you know, well, well patients can play a role. Of course, the big picture is going to ultimately involve politics and policy change to change the way drug pricing actually happens, probably sooner rather than later. But in the meantime, small tweaks patients can do. For instance, the report found the more providers or prescribers you have, the more drugs you take. Researchers at the University of Pennsylvania learned a little bit of cash could go a long way to help smokers kick the habit. The study shows financial incentives are more effective in helping people quit smoking compared to free access to counseling or nicotine replacement aids. The most effective technique required smokers to place an upfront cash deposit that would be taken away if they didn't quit. More than half of those smokers were still smoke-free after six months.
I absolutely love this. I mean, just because we like to separate money and health. But, you know, I remember I had a patient a few years ago. She was a two and a half pack a day smoker. Wow. She decided to quit. She started cold turkey. Every morning, her daughter would come over to her house and take the cash that she would have otherwise spent on the cigarettes mm. and then put it away. She put it in these envelopes, one for a day uh, for an entire year. At the end of that year, they, they had thousands of dollars. Two and a half packs of cigarettes a day is expensive. So they had thousands of dollars, and she took her daughter on a cruise, and that's how she rewarded oh. herself. And it really kept her smoke free for the year. I have to say, though, there's something about this that rubs me the wrong way. First of all, it's not that effective. It's 10 to 15 percent, uh, you know, versus 6 percent, and then there's a relapse rate of about 50 percent at six months. But also the idea of paying somebody to stop doing this vice. I, I mean, there's something about me that says, why do that? But then on the other hand, it actually costs more than $5,000 a year for employers to keep up the health of, uh, you know, to pay for the health things for, for people who smoke. So you could say, well, at the end of the day, you're... Or maybe you're, the money also jump starts it. It gets you, you know, gets you yeah. off. But and it, then it's hopefully. not all that effective. That's the problem. Yeah. But anything that helps, even a little bit. But, Teeny uh, tiny tweaks. There you go. Mm -hmm. Finally, if you're wondering about your health, get a grip. Researchers in Canada say the firmness of a handshake can actually help assess a person's health. The researchers believe grip strength could be a better measure of heart health than blood pressure. This is very interesting. It is. I, you know, when I get my hand crushed by people, I think, <laughs> I'm glad you're in good health, but you maybe demonstrate it a little less. Is, you know, the, the noodle handshake is even I worse. know. I you was going to do that. But, you know, there's a very specific way. It's one thing you tell your kid, have right. a strong hand like that, right. but when they move the hand out like this, yes, and then yes, they yes, crush yes. your last part That's of your fingers, so like, I, I, like you want to. But you know the, At least now you know they're healthy. There's an editorial <laughs> that says that maybe grip strength is a biomarker for aging, and it's certainly not cause and effect. So if you think you're going to go out there and, and do some exercises and improve it, maybe that's not going to be the case. Sorry. Dr. John LaPoo, <laughs> Dr. Holly Phillips, thank you both very much.